so often we, we focus a lot on the in-situ side of things and the species sometimes gets to a point where you've actually got to go ex-situ and unfortunately that's where we are with our, our bearded vulture populations in, in southern Africa. And I titled this Where Science Meets Reality because often what we think we can do and often what ends up happening are sometimes worlds apart. Just to give you a bit of background around uh, how, why we're here, the Biodiversity Management Plan for the Better Vulture established the need for a captive breeding program. We had slipped past the mark of what is considered the, the cutoff of when you kind of need to go down the exit route. And it was established for, and the need was established for a number of reasons. One is a genetic reservoir in case things really went really pear shaped. And the next is an insurance policy. So kind of being able to then build up. A, a wild population from a captive uh, facility. And then obviously that's for basic, the basis for later supplementation and reintroduction. And so in 2015, we started with, with this process of establishing a, a bearded vulture breeding program, but obviously you need uh, good guidance and good governance, and so we established a steering committee to guide this process to ensure that we, we met deliverables and, and we could kind of address issues as and when they came up. But we basically started with a fairly simple premise of basically collect a second egg, hatch that egg, rear it to breeding age, pair that to establish a breeding population and build the exit to population of 20 to 30 unrelated individuals. Sounds fairly easy when you put it on paper, and that's, and that's kind of what we started off with, and that's what we thought, we were, that's where we're going to go. Um, little did we know that we'd have a number of challenges on the way. So often these talks are often focus on a lot of the negatives and, and where we're failing, but I definitely think in the last five years, we've really had some positive outputs out of this program, and one, we've definitely got the international support, so the Vulture Conservation Foundation, or BCF in Europe, which has been instrumental in bringing the, the better vulture populations in Europe back to um, a really healthy population where they're now classified as near threatened. Um, we've got a terms of reference to guide the program and uh, to keep all the participants on the straight and narrow and not to de deviate from the, the main focus. And we've also got varied representation. So often when you put very similar um, minds around the table, you get the same results. And so we've kind of gone for uh, ex situ specialists, raptor biologists, fundraising specialists, it's um, kind of key, key focus, um, authority representation. So we kind of want to try and cover all our bases and, and, and the terms of reference also gives us the ability to call. So we don't kind of, once you're in, you're in. Uh, if we decide that we need uh, some help along the way, if new challenges arise, we've given that way. And that is our guiding principles of how we actually manage this program. We've established some, uh, some set harvesting protocols that we keep making sure that our impact on the, on the wild population is limited. And unfortunately, these are a lot of the things that are in a, within our control. These are the things we can. We can write in terms of reference. We can give letters of appointment to people. But there's a lot of challenges that, that are beyond our control. And kind of for those of you that don't know, this is kind of the landscape that the bearded vulture occurs in. Our mountainous areas of uh, kind of eastern and southern, eastern uh, South Africa and into the, the highlands of Lesotho. So kind of just the, the, the first thing is actually getting there just to, to harvest an egg. It's not as simple, you get in your car and you drive, but then when you do get to a place to harvest, you kind of face with these challenges. Nests, three, four hundred meters down a sheer cliff face. Uh, it makes challenging and, and getting to, to a nest that much more difficult. And not only, as I was saying, you don't just get in your car, just to give you some understanding of, of some of the challenges, this is just in terms of monitoring to actually see what's going on. So, first of all, you've got to drive three hours um, in your motor car, park your motor car, and then you've got to walk another three hours. So before you've even got to see a bearded vulture nest, you've already spent six hours. And bearing in mind these are winter breeders, so your daylight, daylight hours are very limited. So those are just some of the challenges of being able to, in the suitu, you don't just get in your car and drive straight to the nest and whip, up, uh, whip out a pair of binoculars to understand. And then when you do eventually get to the nest six hours later, you've got to be on the other side of uh, a ravine to actually see what's happening. But when you want to do the harvest, you've got to have somebody on the other side of the ravine. So you've invariably got to have three, four people that are actually going out at one time to actually understand and, and say, cool, we're going to harvest an egg. So it's only up to resources. You can't have one or two people doing this. Sometimes it's a team of four or five going to one nest. 
So some, uh, some more of the challenges in terms of the monitoring, you go out there and you see a dark speck on a nest, and you think all the birds are, are nesting. Little do you know that when you come by later, that was actually a bald out. But because you across the other side of a ravine, it's not always that clear because you're not right at the nest. You sometimes fall 600 meters away. You don't, it's not that easy to pick up. So more of the, of the challenges, sometimes you actually, it's more than a three hour walk. So you've got to go and hire some horses and you either are a horse rider or you're not. Um, so, and you either have a nice horse or you don't. There's no in between. So you've got to make sure you get one that you're going to stay on. And if you don't, for anyone that rides horses, if you only do it once a year, you know what's where you saw the next day. Um, and then you get some more nest access challenges. So it's all great seeing the nest and you've got the, the you employ a professional mountain climber that's going to uh, scale down the side of a sheer cliff only to get to the nest and there's this massive overhang that you can't even actually get into the nest. So you can see from that picture there, it all looks, oh, that's easily accessible, it's just off the top of the nest, but there's a, a two to three meter overhang, so you can't even actually get in the nest. So suddenly, those nests that we thought we were going to harvest are actually not even available for harvest. Um, some of the other uh, challenges around the nests is they sometimes change nest holes, so we kind of pre-prep the year before and you kind of go cool we can get there we've assessed it the climate can get down during that breeding season they move holes and that that nest that particular becomes inaccessible but it's not all doom and gloom sometimes they choose really easy nest sites and here we can see a previous colleague Charles Brummer coming down very easy easily accessible and so sometimes there are some positives but the, one of the things in life that I've learned is that there's one thing you cannot control and that's the weather for the past four weeks, we've been trying every day to uh, do some monitoring, um, and this is what you get greeted with. Low cloud cover and snow on the top peaks, not this year's snow, but the low cloud cover. And so suddenly getting up there is no longer an option. And then when you do get a chance and the, the clouds lift, you can see that it, the wind picks up. And um, anyone that's ever flown in the berg, it's not just normal wind that just flows slightly off the cliff that creates under, undercurrents, turbulence, and when you are using some of the equipment of a helicopter in the mountains and wind, they're not uh, combinations that you actually want to use. And not only that, this is kind of some of the challenges. Um, your equipment to get there costs 14,000 Rand an hour, um, and you're looking at three to four hours to check three or four nests. So you can imagine the costs to actually get to some of these nests are quite considerable because you can't actually even get there on foot, you actually have to use a chopper. So those are some of, the, some of the challenges around our equipment. And then sometimes what you do is we, um, we kind of look for cheaper options and then you learn that good equip is dear equip. Um, and, and very unfortunate, uh, a few years ago, when we did look at, at a lower powered aircraft um, that just wasn't able to fly in the Berg and we almost lost uh, four people in the process of trying to get this process going. Fortunately, everyone walked away, but that's, you, don't, you don't look for cheaper options, you've got to go with the equipment that works in the areas. But as you can see, also the challenging snow conditions. And these are all those, these weather challenges and equipment challenges that all add to the dynamics of getting, getting this program going. But then there's also other problems, the typical administrative challenges. So when we first started, obviously a large proportion of the population is, is in the situ. So we then governed by the CITES regulations and when we applied for our first permit to import some second eggs, we discovered that the SUTU's membership of CITES had uh, been suspended because they hadn't been filling in reports because they'd never been issuing any permits because they weren't doing any trade. So instead of su submitting a null return, they thought, well, we're not doing anything, so we don't need to do anything. And so we then, that put some challenges and, and we were very fortunate that DIA stepped up went to the SUTU, did some training, got the processes in place to get their membership reinstated. Only to get hit by the second obstacle, and that's in terms of our own CITES regulations, and that there's a defined port of entry, and that's Masiri. So that is on the one side of the, the country, and, the, and on the opposite side of all the nests. And that is a four and a half hour drive, and now you've got the second egg. You don't want to be spending any extra time in an incubator, in a vehicle, trying to get that back into an uh, incubator ready for hatching. So through a, a process of about two years, we've actually uh, very fortunately had the, the national minister give us uh, a deviation from that, and we now can enter South Africa through any 
of the, the normal port, so we can kind of go outside, pass, harvest an egg and drive straight back down, we don't have to drive across the country. Um, and then obviously some of the challenges are around the, the cross-border aerial access. So we're kind of thinking, well, some of the nests are just into the Sutu, but you can't just go and land a helicopter in the Sutu if you take off from uh, Manskal. You kind of got to fly to Bloemfontein first, go through customs, fly to Maseru, go through customs, and then fly all the way back to the escarpment just above Manskal. So those are some of the challenges, and that ferry time all adds up at 14,000 rand an hour. Some of the challenges that we're still grappling with is around bird, bird ownership. In South Africa, it's fairly easy. The state owns the bird, but when they the Sutu and they're coming to South Africa, it's once again crossing an international uh, border, and we've got to then start understanding how who owns that. And then obviously some of the challenges are the availability of resources. I just used the helicopter as an example. Not every pilot can fly in the bird. And currently we've most probably got one at a push two that can really do that and the available equipment to actually fly there. So you can't fly a Robinson 22 in the bird because it's not going to get to the top where you need to be. And also just the person that's operating that machine. And then we've got some of the species challenges. So, kind of, if you read the literature, what we base the lot of this on, uh, two egg clutches, we'll get the second egg, but that's not always the case. Sometimes there's only a single egg, and sometimes the second egg is also infertile. So, there is a defined breeding period, which has both a positive and negative impact, because you kind of need to know when you've got to work and when your options are. But, at that time, you've got a very small window where you can actually access a nest. And if you have a cold front come through and mass, a, a big dump of snow on the mountains, you suddenly find that that's the season gone. Um, that leads into the limited harvesting period. And also then the productivity is less than 50% for the species. So in essence, they only breed every second year. So that reduces the number of nests that you can actually harvest. But it's not all doom and gloom. Um, and so I kind of wanted to put up here how many nests we've actually accessed. So we've, I'll put it as an X because we kind of some we've partially accessed because you get there and you can't get into the nest itself. Others we've managed to harvest successfully from. Um, and we've, we've brought in a total of about 12 eggs and one second chick. And I put that out there because on our permit we just thought we were harvesting eggs. And when the climate got down there, both the first and second eggs had hatched. So we actually brought down a second chick. And today we've got a total of eight birds into the program. Not quite where we want it to be, but that's as a result of some of these challenges. Moving forward, we do have uh, some way to go, looking at adjusting the harvesting protocols. Do we harvest the first egg? Do we harvest just a single egg? Do we take the entire clutch? And these are some of the realities that we have to grapple with if we want to see this program succeed. And, and then the big one is the improved fundraising, not only for monitoring, but harvesting access. If we, we can't be affording to drive um, eight to 10 hours to get to a nest, we've got to be able to get there quicker. Just in conclusion, just like to put up these acknowledgements. Um, as you can see, it's a number of people that are involved in trying to make this program a success. Thank you.